thank you, Claude, for leading us in worship and doing a wonderful job. We appreciate it so very, very much. Is uh, Jonah a book in the Bible? Is Jonah a book in the Bible? hesitant there. In a Barna poll, a Barna research poll, 61% of Christians said that yes, Jonah is a book in the Bible. But 27% of Christians said no, it is not. And 12% said they had no clue. So about a 60-40 split. So if you had any hesitation this morning, right here it is. Jonah is a book in the Bible, four chapters, 47 verses. It is a bit hard to find, I will admit. It's in the Minor Prophets. Over there after Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Daniel and Lamentations and Hosea and Joel and Amos and Obadiah and then Jonah. Sometime find it, okay? Because we're going to be in Jonah for four Sundays, and I'd like for you to go swimming with me. All right? What do we learn from Jonah 1? Very simply, God calls every one of us to share the gospel. You with me? God calls every one of us to share the gospel. Look at it with me. First of all, the great city. Uh, Jonah opens this way. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. The great city of Nineveh. If you go to Genesis, you find out that Nineveh, Gen uh, Nineveh was established by Nimrod. And it has always traditionally been known as the great city. Now you and I know the nicknames of some cities. The Big Apple. Come on, folks, let's go. The Windy City? Sin City? What? Yep. The Big Easy? Uh, Little Detroit? All right. Little Detroit. Burnt Chimney? All right. We're, we're, we're getting there this morning, okay? Nineveh, traditionally known as the great city. In 700 B.C., Sennacherib established it as the capital of Assyria. Great city of Nineveh. God called Jonah to go there and preach against it because its wickedness had come up to God. Interestingly enough, if you read the book of Jonah, Jonah provides no details about the wickedness of Nineveh. If you want to read about the wickedness of Nineveh, go to another little minor prophet called Nahum, and there you can read about the wickedness of Nineveh. But God called him to go to preach at Nineveh, the great city. And here's a question I want to ask you this morning. What is our great city? The answer is basically wherever we are, wherever we go, that's our great city. Maybe it's our homes and our families. Maybe that's our mission field. And all of us probably have people in our families that are not believers, not Christians. That's our mission field. Maybe it's our workplace. Maybe our great city is our classroom. Maybe it's our neighborhood. Maybe it is Forest City or Rutherford County or Pope County or Cleveland County. Maybe it's Walmart or the shopping mall or the bank. But basically, our great city is wherever we are, and we see people, and we're concerned for people. We have a heart for people. We have a heart for worship, and we have a heart for people coming to God. A few weeks ago, we went up to the Flat Rock Playhouse to see Annie. Some of you go? Anybody else go? Great show. After seeing Annie, we went to uh, Cracker Barrel to eat dinner, and... Uh, we would not been seated very long when the people next to us got up to leave and the lady turned around and said, we know you. 
Uh, now, most of you know that I take uh, remembering names very, that's very important to me. I could not call her name. I felt really bad. And she began to talk, and we made some connections in our church, as a matter of fact. And they, we talked for a little bit, and they left. Uh, we were sitting there a little bit longer. Another family was seated, sort of to my left. And three or four adults, three or four children. The, the children had been playing ball somewhere. It was obvious. And Rhonda leaned over and said, don't we know them? And we, uh, you know, we were nosy. Uh, looked a little closer and realized they were from my home church, the Elizabeth Church in Shelby. Uh, old friends, really. And so after we ate, we went over to them, struck up a conversation, reminisced a little bit. What do we say in cases like that? It's a what? It's a small world. And we say, you know, everywhere we go, we find people we know, right? And certainly with social media today, the world has gotten smaller. We're connected. And so our great city is wherever we are. Far city. David and Katie were telling us, in your city there were 7 million people, and in your state, 25 million people? Wherever we are, that's our great city, and we are called to share the gospel. But secondly, what about the great escape? This is how we know Jonah. Listen to these words, verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. God called Jonah to go to Nineveh. But instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah headed for Tarshish. Instead of going 500 miles east, he headed 2,000 miles west. He headed in the opposite direction from where God had called him to go. Uh, on Monday of this past week, I needed to make a hospital visit in Spartanburg. And uh, I told Allison, I said, if you want to ride with me, and after I make this hospital visit, we'll go to Strawberry Hill. Now, many of you know I like to frequent Strawberry Hill, uh, particularly the ice cream and the strawberries and the peaches and all those kind of good things. And so we made the visit, and I've been to Strawberry Hill so many times I could go in my sleep, basically. But I decided, leaving the hospital from where I was, I was going to ask Siri how to get there. And so I held up my phone, and I said, directions to Strawberry Hill. And Siri said, getting directions for San Francisco. And so I said it again. I said, uh, directions to Strawberry Hill. And she said, getting directions to San Francisco. And she started telling me how long it was going to take me to get there. And I started telling her how dumb and stupid she was. You ever do that? And finally I said, Siri, directions to James Cooley's Strawberry Hill. And she took me right there. Jonah, instead of going 500 miles east, went, headed 2,000 miles west. And by the way, some people think this means that Jonah was wealthy because that would have been a 12-month cruise. Well, here's the question. Why did Jonah run away? You see, many of us read this book and say, why in the world did he do that? God called him. Why did he run away from God? But before we beat Jonah up, do we not do the same thing? Do we not have the message of abundant and eternal life in Jesus Christ? Do we not have the answer for the world's problems and so many times we shy away, we back away from sharing that message. So many times we're ashamed. I wish that all of you could have been out there this morning. There was fire in that room this morning. We want there to be fire in this church. How many times do we back away from our calling of sharing the gospel? Just like God called Jonah, he calls you and he calls me to share the love of Jesus with every person that we meet through word and deed. John Ortberg, 
in his book, The Me I Want to Be, uh, tells a story about uh, he and his wife, Nancy, in the middle of the night hearing a beeping sound. Now, actually, John woke up to an elbow in his ribs. And his wife was saying, what is that beeping sound? And John didn't really want to admit it because he knew if he admitted hearing it, he was going to have to get up and go check. But finally, he got up and he went. He was gone for a while. He came back, got back in bed, and Nancy said, what was that? And he said, it was a smoke detector. She said, what'd you do? He said, I took the batteries out. She said, why'd you do that? He said, well, there's no smoke. Didn't see any evidence of fire. Didn't smell anything. I checked the house. Everything's fine. So I took, it's, it's the batteries. So I took the batteries out. They went back to bed. They went back to sleep. The next morning, John had an early morning meeting. And so he got up and he went downstairs. He noticed a few weird things. The hall lights wouldn't work downstairs. Then when he went to his garage, the garage door would not open automatically like it was supposed to. He went to his breakfast meeting. He had not been at the table very long before the server came and said, Are you John Orberg? He said, Yes. And the server said, Your wife just called and wants you to come home. Your house is on fire. So he raced home. Fire trucks everywhere. Police cars everywhere. And what had happened was that birds had built a nest in his chimney. Somehow it had started smoldering. The smoke detector had started beeping what did John do? He'd taken the batteries out. And so a fire had started and did great damage in his house. And so John writes this book and asks this question, what kind of idiot would take the batteries out of a smoke detector and go back to bed when there's a fire in your house? And John said, I did that. How many times do we hear a beeping in our souls and in our hearts and our minds? We have the message of Christ to a broken world. And we take the batteries out and we go back to sleep and shame on us. Our calling is to share that simple message Before we beat John up too bad for running, let's admit that many times we do the same thing. And so the great city and the great escape, and then you know the story, I think, the great storm, it reads this way, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. Wow. This great city, this great calling, and a great escape, and then a great storm. And where's Jonah? Can you believe that? Where's Jonah? He's asleep in the bottom of the ship, and the captain came. And the sailors were afraid, and they said, Who are you? And he offers this confession of faith. Look at verse 9 if you have your Bible. Here's what Jonah says. I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. It's a great confession of faith. I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. They said, what are you doing? What's going on here? You see, they had cast lots and found out that Jonah was at fault. And Jonah said, I tell you what you do. Throw me overboard, and the sea will become calm. To me, there's a little bit of humor in chapter 1. Uh, the sailors tried to bring the ship under control. Uh, the way it reads is they, they tried strenuously they used the oars. They dug into the water. They tried to bring the boat under control, but when they could not do that, the storm got worse. They knew they were going to throw Jonah overboard. They prayed first. I found that sort of funny. 
Uh, if you want to see their prayer, look at verse 14. O oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you, O oh Lord, have done, O oh Lord, have done as you please. So they prayed before they threw him overboard. And then they threw him into the sea, and you know this part of the story, verse 17. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. What do we make of the storm? What do we make of the storm? God is at work in us. And through us and with us. But God will also work in spite of us. You see, what we have to realize in this story is that when we run away from God, we'll run right into Him. You ever thought about that? God has called us to the great city. Oftentimes we're like Jonah and we offer the great escape. But when we run, we will run smack dab. Can I say that this morning? For the English teachers here, can I say smack dab? You run away from God and you will run smack dab into God. You know, our storms can take a lot of forms. All of us encounter storms. It might be grief, it might be sickness, it might be hardship, it might be anger, it might be worry, it might be anxiety, but everybody in here deals with storms God is working in us, with us, through us, or he will work in spite of us to bring about his eternal plan. And sometimes we forget that. John Ortberg, let me tell you one more story, and I'll close. Was going out of the country and needed a prescription filled. We told David and Katie, we got a lot of pharmacists in this church. Okay? So I'm going to tell a pharmacy story. He's going out of the country, needed a prescription field. So what did he do? He called the automated system. You ever do that? You know, he called the automated system. I do that all the time. Um, and sometimes I talk to that automated system like I was talking to Siri a minute ago. But he called the automated system, punched in his numbers, said, we got you, we'll have your prescription ready at such and such a time, right? You, you know how that works. So he goes to the pharmacy. And there's been a mix-up. And they don't have it ready. And John says to the pharmacist, um, I used your automated system. It said it would be ready at such and such a time. I'm going out of the country. I've got to have this medicine. The pharmacist said, well, I'm sorry. We do not have it ready. There's been a mix-up. And John said he felt this anger. You ever do this? Anger just welling up inside of him. And he took it out on the pharmacist. First, he looked, he's a pastor, by the way. He looked around to see if he saw any of his church members. And then he let the pharmacist have it. He was having church service that night, so he went back to his church and went to his office and opened his Bible, and guess what it said? Brothers are to love one another. And he realized that in the midst of our storm, we acknowledge God he will speak to us so remember in the storms of life God is working in us and with us and through us or he will work in spite of us because God has an eternal plan and he is working that plan and he wants us to be part of it so here's a question very simply, this summertime, this July, we're going to have fun with this. I'm going to have fun with it. I hope you are. Will we share the gospel? Or will, be, will we be like Jonah and run away? It's that simple. 482 is our hymn. Jesus is calling, I think, Scott. Jesus is calling. 482, we challenge you and we invite you to respond to God's call. Will we share the gospel, the love of Jesus with the folks that we meet every day, every